I thank you very much, Derek. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about um, head and neck emergencies. This is an anxiety-provoking topic for a lot of people, but we're going to keep it simple and focus on the things that I think are important to remember. Um, so, um, uh, first of all, what do we look for in sinuses? And Dr. Peterson went over a little bit of this um, earlier, so I'll just touch on it. But we normally image for complications in the ED, so that's intracranial complications, uh, soft tissue complications, orbital stuff. MR and CT both play important roles. MR is what we want if something is going badly and we need to look more closely. CT is what we usually have. And, uh, and Dr. Peterson showed a couple of cases of this earlier as well. These are complications of acute sinusitis. You'll see on that um, there's a, a diffusion restricting collection in the anterior soft tissues and posteriorly as well with surrounding contrast enhancement. So this is a subdural empyema, and then what we used to call POTS puffy tumor before we had the imaging, and now it's a, it's a uh, soft tissue abscess. But there are other complications that can be uh, really troublesome, although rarer than those two. So this is an immunocompromised patient with CLL and facial pain, and you'll look <coughs> excuse me, at the CT on the left, and you see that inspissated stuff in the left maxillary sinus, but also subtler, and something to take away that Dr. Peterson actually mentioned was if you look at that fat behind the maxillary sinus, you'll see it doesn't look the same as the opposite side. It looks more fuzzy. That's um, uh, uh, periantral fat stranding, and that's indication that something is moving out of the sinus, and that's very dangerous. And if you look, this patient also got a CTA because we were worried about vascular problems in her. And um, you'll see that there's not enhancement right there in the cavernous sinus and in the internal carotid artery, and also a collection, subperiosteal collection right there. So this is additional complications of acute sinusitis to think about, which is cavernous sinus thrombosis, carotid occlusion, which is rare but can be devastating, and then also pretty commonly, more commonly, though, um, orbital abscess. All right, and then just to, to make a, another point on fungal sinusitis and think about fungal sinusitis is really two different diseases, isn't it? So you remember that acute invasive fungal sinusitis is the disease that we really worry about. That's in immunocompromised people, as Dr. Peterson said, fulminant spread and a really high um, morbidity and mortality. Whereas chronic fungus, fungal sinusitis is relatively common, happens in people who are immunocompetent, usually an indolent affection. And this is a fulminant um, acute invasive sinusitis on the, on the left. All right, let's move to the orbits. So um, one thing, uh, so these are two separate patients, and I put up the uh, sentence, so how do we describe the locations of these abnormalities, right? This one right here and this one right here, because how we describe the locations of these abnormalities, it really helps drive the treatment of these problems, and that's what our, <coughs> excuse me, clinicians are really interested in. So first of all, let's step back and look at the orbital anatomy. Just really briefly, you'll remember that there's the orbital septum. We can't see it on CT, but it's there. It's a very important structure in the eye. So it's a, it's a thick fascia that runs from the orbit to the um, globe, and it's very effective at preventing uh, <coughs> excuse me, infections from moving from anterior to posterior. Uh, and because of the septum, we usually say something anterior to the orbit is preceptal, and then something posterior to the septum is postseptal. I think these terms are pretty clear, and um, they're clear for our uh, clinician colleagues as well. Uh, the orbit gets a little confusing because we have two separate words for this as well, periorbital and orbital that you've probably heard too. So periorbital means preceptal, orbital means postseptal. I think we have been trending toward or moving toward preceptal and postseptal for description because I think it's clear. All right, so let's take a look at this one patient that was on our left before with those two patients we saw before. And you'll see that there's a lot of fat stranding, there's soft tissue thickening anterior to the orbit in the preceptal space. If we look at the retrobulbar fat, the orbital fat it looks nice and clean throughout. So this is a preceptal cellulitis, and this patient is going to be discharged with or without antibiotics. And then we have this other patient, too, who was right next to the image, the image right next to him. They have some abnormality in the preceptal space, but more importantly, you see this collection in the postceptal space along the uh, medial orbital wall, and that's a subperiosteal abscess, and something in the postceptal space may dictate more aggressive intervention. 
All right, just a little bit more on orbital infections. So often a complication of an acute sinusitis, like you saw in this last case. A part of the problem is it, it causes proptosis that increases the orbital pressure. And then what we worry about is optic nerve stretching and damage, and that's due to either um, central retinal artery or venous occlusion. So you want to look, if you have proptosis, you want to look at the globe, look at the posterior aspect of the globe, as in this case, you see a little bit of what we call tenting in the back of the globe. That's when there's pressure, it's pushing the orbit out, and it's actually um, uh, straightening that optic nerve. And when it gets really bad, like this one, this is severe uh, globe temping, uh, uh, tenting, and that's an ophthalmologic emergency. That's when you're, the referring clinicians need to know that right away because they need to be able to save the globe. All right, let's move to the mouth. So you see this right here. This is something we deal with all the time. So this is an odontogenic abscess, so a low density collection with peripheral uh, contrast enhancement, so a common abnormality. The reason I put this in here was to just remind you there's a couple things that we can help out with in emergency radiology. One thing is to look for cortical dehiscence so you'll see right here on the bone windows, you'll see this periapical lucency around it, which is an abscess, and you can see the loss of the alveolar cortex at the lateral aspect. So what does that do? That gives us some greater diagnostic confidence in saying the infection is actually coming from there, so that's where the um, treatment needs to be targeted and also lets the emergency physician know that there's nothing else that they need to be worried about. And also, I would comment on the degree of dental caries too, because that can have an impact in terms of their follow-up care. All right, other causes of mouth pain. This one's pretty busy slide on the CT neck, but um, I don't have a windowing that's clear enough. But here we see um, this is actually a calcification. And there's a submandibular gland next to it. You'll see there's ductal enlargement. And you'll see there's thickening of the platysma, the little linear muscle over it, and fat stranding right here, which is often an indicator that I use to kind of pick up on subtle head and neck abnormalities. Platysma is a nice little compass. And this is acute sialadenitis. So what do we see? We see an enlarged enhancing gland, as in this case. Uh, we often see a stone. Sometimes if you get lucky, you'll see ductal dilation. And then you often see, with, as with the platysma and the fat stranding, you'll see adjacent cellulitis and myositis. And the submandibular gland uh, lies in this sublingual and submandibular space, so you'll get um, abnormalities all throughout here. Complications are pretty rare, but they include um, abscess. And any time I see a head and neck abnormality, I think it's important. We often don't look at the airway, but it's important to look at the airway and comment on the airway to make sure that you don't miss airway narrowing that needs to be intervened on in some way. <clears throat> Excuse me. And here's a, a complication of salinitis. So here's an abscess. And so this person had this um, enlarged submandibular gland and is decompressed in those sublingual and submandibular spaces. So here's another thing we deal with quite often. So this is a fishbone, and we see um, radiographs. We're moving towards CT more than radiographs. We've found that um, a lot of times you'll get a CT or a, a radiograph, and the clinicians will want a CT anyway, and we can see them a lot better on CT uh, as well. So where do we find them? Well, on the next CT, they're usually going to be oriented in the direction of the esophagus. There's a bunch of mimics in the head and neck um, that I won't go over, <clears throat> but can make it difficult to tell whether, it is a whether there is a foreign body there, whether it's calcification of the sternal cartilage or some other um, uh, cartilage in the neck. Uh, more often than not, they're oriented along the direction of the esophagus. Part of the problem is mimics are usually not oriented in the direction of the esophagus, but if a foreign body is not aligned with the esophagus, there's actually a greater association with perforation because they tend to get stuck in the wall. Um, so here is, uh, I would encourage you on these to window and level uh, appropriately, and I'll mag up and use your zoom. And you can see, can't see it at all here, but there is actually a fishbone in the esophagus right here, just next to the sternal cartilage. Uh, did I put an arrow on it? Yep. And, uh, but our clinicians, I think they probably didn't believe us at the time, and then um, uh, we got the CT anyway, and we can see it really nicely on CT. Here's another um, foreign body case. This is a foreign body in trauma. Uh, so um, this is something we might not think to look for in a trauma pan scan, but it's important to look for. So here you see the endotracheal tube, and you see this metallic foreign body that we don't know what it is. And on scout view, we can see it uh, right here. 
So that turned out to be a, a dental crown that was knocked off. Sometimes people are intubated in the field or if they have poor dentition, you can knock these things off. They can get into the airway. And if the endotracheal tube is there, they can get stuck here. Uh, not a problem usually if they're swallowed, but can be a problem if they're aspirated after the person's intubated. So we want to let people know that if there's any foreign bodies in the airway, we want to make sure they take them out before they extubate people. Uh, here's another um, uh, foreign body that we are used to looking for, pretty scary stuff, so button batteries. This is the second most common place for a, for a button battery to get stuck. The first is actually in the stomach or in the, um, is to be swallowed, but they can get lodged in all sorts of different places. The um, damage can be caused by leakage from the battery, um, alkali environment kind of burning the soft tissue, and also toxicity down the road. A caution about um, button batteries, uh, you know, often we try to, we might be asked, is this a coin or is this a button battery if you don't know what the patient swallowed? This is a, a publication from um, uh, Dr. Lin in um, otolaryngology that shows a variety of button batteries, and you can see how similar a lot of those button batteries look to coins. You could be hard pressed to tell the difference between a coin and a button battery on a radiograph. So I would, when you're, when you're giving a definitive opinion, I would be suspicious. Okay, moving on to the head and neck, or I mean the throat, rather. So these are two different patients. They both have sore throat and swelling. So our first patient has tonsillitis. That was a patient on the left. You can see there's no low-density collection there. Nice, homogeneous, enlarged tonsil. Sometimes you can see what's called kissing tonsils, is when you have a viral infection, maybe both of them enlarge. Differential is lymphoid hypoplasia, or hyperplasia, rather. But our other patient had a peritonsillar or tonsillar abscess. So this is a low density collection, usually centered in the uh, palatine tonsil. You often get fat stranding in the peripharyngeal space right here. It can be pretty difficult to uh, figure out if that's a collection that has um, uh, come out of the tonsil or not. And uh, again, comment on the degree of airway narrowing. <clears throat> And there's a lot of confusion, I think, around what does it mean, peritonsillar abscess? Do I call this a peritonsillar abscess? Do I call this a tonsillar abscess? What's the difference? The confusion partly arises in tonsillar abscesses are pretty common in children. Um, in adults, uh, you can see, we can't see the tonsillar capsule on imaging, but it's around here. But in adults, there's almost always extension outside of the tonsillar capsule in adults. So it's technically correct to actually call a tonsillar collection in an adult a peritonsillar abscess. But what people are really interested when you're making the distinction is where this infection has spread to, because the uh, if something is really just located in the tonsil, usually you can do transoral um, aspiration, and that can usually solve the problem. Whereas if you're clearly in a um, peritonsillar space here, uh, that may dictate surgical decompression from different approaches. So uh, the most important thing, whether you call it a peritonsillar abscess or a tonsillar abscess, is to describe exactly where the infection is, because that will drive the approach to treatment. All right, so here's another pain. This is um, or a, a patient with throat pain and strider. And you can see how thickened that um, epiglottis is. And there's thickening of the airy epiglottic folds here. There's narrowing of the airway. There's a bulging appearance. So this is epiglottitis. It's now a lot more common to see it in unvaccinated adults than it is in kids because kids are getting vaccinated for H flu and strep. And um, uh, what do we see? We see, as we described, there's some um, enlargement of the epiglottis. There's actually air here. This is a case of um, emphysematous epiglottitis. This is the only one I've seen before. There's effacement of the vollecula. There's thickening of these airy, airy epiglottic folds. The epiglottis, um, along the size of the epiglottis, there are, there's soft tissues that closes along with the epiglottis to keep stuff from coming in. Um, and those all get thickened and really dramatically narrow the airway. Um, so that's one of the difficulties. In adults, there's, um, our airway's a lot bigger than in kids, so there's less of, a, of a complications associated with epiglottitis and airway, um, uh, airway uh, loss. So uh, a lot of these people do get imaged with CT, and we can see it a little bit better. Okay, and this is my last case. This is a case of a patient with um, progressive dysphagia, and they have a really complex collection prevertebral space here all throughout the neck, continues in the anterior neck. So what do we want to know about this case? Well, we really want to know where does this thing go, right? This is a prevertebral abscess. 
and very complex abscess in the head and neck, but we're most interested in where does this collection end? And you can see it goes way down and it ends in the mediastinum, anteriorly and posteriorly. And this patient developed mediastinitis, so this is one of the complications of head and neck too, something we want to look for. Part of the reason is that it's a very high mortality, about a 50-50 chance of survival last um, systematic review that I saw. So, and the problem is these prevertebral soft collections or collections in the deep head and neck can communicate with the retropharyngeal space. And this pharyngeal, retropharyngeal space goes all the way from the skull base down to about T3, so, and it's a clear, there's nothing stopping infection from getting from the head to the neck. So when you see a collection back here, you want to define it and make sure that you tell your clinicians about it because um, the thing that's going to help people is early detection and debridement. And that's what I have for you. Thank you very much for your time.